Hello, welcome to Living Arts. I'm your host, Jackie Suarez. Thank you for tuning in. Tonight we're going to be speaking with Harlan Jacobson. He is the founder of Talk Cinema and a film critic. Harlan, welcome to the show. Hi, Jackie. I'm glad to be here. I'm delighted to have you here. Uh, a lot of the things that we cover on the show, um, we've done dance, various bands, music, and I don't think that we've actually um, kind of explored just the film industry enough or people like yourself that actually, you know, uh, do critiques. So welcome. And um, I'd like to start by, I guess, um, just going over your background and how you became a film critic. Well, um, the full version, um, abbreviated uh, for the show, is that I carried a couch into the Bureau Chief of Variety's uh, house in Chicago, Illinois, when I was a young guy looking for a job. And he, I was uh, trying to be a journalist, and he needed somebody to start on Monday, and I started uh, reporting for Variety in the Chicago Bureau of Variety. This is 1973. Um, <clears throat> I am a child of the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, movies in America um, became incredibly uh, vibrant um, in the 60s, and because they, f you felt like. Um, the way to take the pulse of the culture, uh, to, to think big, were, were movies. And American, young American film directors were making mm -hmm. uh, movies like well, anything that you can think of by Coppola, Scorsese, uh, Friedkin. Um, and it was incredibly exciting to uh, see films and talk about films. So my career path really started at Variety where mm -hmm. I uh, worked. Now when you say variety, I think of the variety that we have here in the city where you have the listings for various acting jobs and things like that. Well, Is that about right or um, was it a little different? I think that in a way you're putting together a couple of different publications. The mm -hmm. ones that really had all of the little minutia uh, mm -hmm. acting jobs and stuff were, uh, it was a trade paper called Backstage. Oh, right, um, right, right. Mm -hmm. Variety was a family-owned, um, uh, it was the Bible of show businesses. It was a trade paper mm -hmm. that had at its peak maybe 30, 35,000 uh, readers, mm -hmm. but they were everybody in the international uh, uh, business, uh, film, television, um, uh, stage. It started as a legit and a vaudeville publication, and it evolved as media evolved over the course of the 20th century. And the family held on to it for um, two or three generations mm -hmm. uh, before selling it to a, a British publisher, and it's gone on in, in other with things now. But Variety was the most important uh, trade paper in the world for many, many, many years. And I remember when I had this Chicago job, I uh, took a trip in, a, in my old hippie van up into the Wisconsin <laughs> Dells and stopped at a summer theater and said, hi, uh, I'm looking for a place to camp uh, tonight, and I see you guys have a, 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 a theater. You think I could sort of pull up next to your lake? And they said, well, who are you? And I said, well, I'm Harlan Jacobson. I'm in the Chicago Bureau of Variety. And you'd have thought that I just yelled free nuts to squirrels because there were <laughs> 10,000 actors that came out of nowhere from behind trees, underneath rocks. Variety had, in its day, variety, and, that, and that was part of its day, had uh, power like n no other publication. Mm -hmm. right? uh, it was not second to the New York Times in terms of the effect it had in creating the agenda for what was happening in show business news. Gotcha. So then, um, so you wind up getting this position and becoming a film critic. Now, did you actually study film at all? Um, yes, actually, I did. It, it, um, it, this was this was really before there was studying film. Right, as kind um, of a, a major. Uh, the, yeah, and, and you know, so many universities have gone into the business of doing film schools because mm -hmm. it's a, it's an important revenue source. Everybody wants, you know, to become a director. So the universities have found that they can charge, you know, a great deal of money to kids who want to go to film school. In those days, film studies were critical studies, and they were just sort of happening. I was at Haverford College, and there was a professor who was interested in film, as I was, and we were reading all sorts of very abstruse texts uh, from uh, France and things, uh, Roland Barthes and semiology and all this stuff. I assure you, I have no idea what any of it means. I remember that Woody Allen once made a joke about being a double major in um, uh, semiotics and and uh, ideology, and it was called idiotics. Um, you know, so it, this was a, um, a, a partly a college course. But what I what you really did to study films and uh, the old-fashioned way, which is, I went to a lot of movies, mm -hmm. and I went to a lot of movies because it was 
like I said, it was an incredibly vibrant time to go to the movies, and I would go off to see all these things, Repulsion by Roman Polanski, uh, Love Story, you know, which was a, uh, you know, a terrible movie, but it was a huge blockbuster, you know, uh, studio hit for the first time in 20 years. They had a movie that made money. Why do you think Love Story was a terrible movie? Well, I watched it not too long ago, um, and compared to its sort of offspring uh, of the last few years, it wasn't so bad. You know, I liked looking at Ali McGraw, I liked looking at Ryan uh, O'Neill. I've softened in my dotage. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, I mean, I guess a lot of people, I guess, critically wouldn't say that it was a great film, but... Critically, it wasn't a good film. Mm -hmm. um, it, it it's kind of cheesy. It was, it's kind of cheesy. And what you want in a film is a film that you feel um, you really are being led into a discussion of something that's important to you that you may uh, not have seen in quite the same way before. And Love Story, you know, it starts with what can you say about a girl who died? Um, and you know that they're going to say a few things and that you're going to cry, you know, uh, roughly at the 59th minute. So mm -hmm. uh, predictability is not necessarily a good hallmark of a, or rather a hallmark of a good film. Right. So um, it must have been really interesting. I mean, as you mentioned at that time, there was just like this explosion. And I think a big part of that is that people began to kind of look at certain directors or like, you know, let's say Martin Scorsese, you know, and trying to follow him and kind of turn him into this, you know, folk hero. So they wanted to follow the films that he was doing at the time. Well, it's because film has always felt as though, you know, it's the seventh art. And in America, it struggles for legitimacy still in some ways. You know, you go to a place like Cannes and the Cannes Film Festival and, and they have a red carpet, but it's not a celebrity red carpet. It's an artist's red carpet. It's because people have struggled to, you know, make something that's, that has a certain amount of either passion or intelligence or what have you to be able to do that thing about taking the pulse of the world that we live in. And they venerate artists like that in the same way that they venerate stage directors or novelists or playwrights or what have you. And in this country, we're caught between that thing that's called show business. Is it a show or is it a business? Is it an art uh, or is it a business? And um, It's more celebrity driven it's, here. It, it still is. And mm -hmm. What's wonderful, what was wonderful about the films in the 60s and 70s is you really had the feeling that movies were finally emerging in America as a, an overt art, not something that was a, a subtle art, you know, that was a studio system product in which the director may have been making an artistic film unbeknownst to Jack Warner, who was the head of the studio, or maybe Jack Warner knew about it and figured as long as it made money, he didn't care. That wasn't really very much the case. And so it was a very exciting time to watch uh, movies in the 60s and 70s. Think about some of those, you know, those great titles, whether it was Mean Streets or whether it was Raging Bull in the 80s or whether it was The Deer Hunter. Um, all these fabulous movies were talking about America and the American experience, and it was mirroring the kind of movies that were being made all uh, over Europe at the time. And uh, so it was very exciting. I went from Variety after reporting on the industry and learning about how the, the business worked uh, and also reviewing for Variety. I went to the Film Society of Lincoln Center because I covered the New York Film Festival mm -hmm. uh, for Variety. And I, they hired me as uh, the uh, senior editor of their magazine, Film Comment, which is a movie magazine that is the most intelligent film magazine in America. It's the answer to the French intellectual magazine, Cahiers du Cinema, um, and other you know, national uh, magazines around the world, where they talk about movies in very serious terms. You know? mm -hmm. And I did that for the 1980s, and that was a wonderful sort of uh, period and a wonderful experience to edit a magazine uh, that took movies from around the world and American movies very seriously. And it, I also, it, I was intimately involved in the New York Film Festival mm -hmm. um, uh, as well, um, running press conferences and uh, f f with filmmakers during the festival or during, during its spring festival, new directors, new films. So I became very familiar with the interface between a great film, a great artist, and, and a great audience that wants to give those people, you know, room to run on screen and, and, and do something that they haven't seen before and something important. 
socially important or pointing out some aspect of our lives now. Yeah. So I guess you fast forward, I guess, to 1992 when you began Talk Cinema. Yes. So why don't you explain, um, I guess, the idea behind Talk Cinema and uh, what it's all about? Well, um, having, um, it's a, in a nutshell, it's about having the film festival experience, but you know, where, where you are, bringing a little bit of that to you. And one of the things that I loved about the New York Film Festival, as well as now that I've become really involved in the film festival world, um, is going into seeing a movie that you really don't know very much about. Mm -hmm. um, when you go to Cannes or Toronto or Sundance, these sort of tentpole business professional festivals, movies are being shown for the first time. Mm -hmm. And nobody really knows very much about them because nobody's seen them. There hasn't been a buzz. There hasn't mm -hmm. been a word of mouth. There haven't been any reviews. There haven't been any press kits. There's been nothing. You're really going in not knowing what you're going to see. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was the way people should see movies. And talk cinema is essentially an, an application of that for, you know, everyday people, people who um, are connoisseurs, of, uh, you know, or consumers, I should say, of art in, in every day, in their every day. They may want to go to a, uh, Caramore for a concert. They may want to go um, f to Lincoln Center for a concert. They may want to go to the Hirshhorn for, you know, uh, art. They want some kind of lens on the life that they're leading. And that's what films can do. And good films do do that. And if I told you that you were going to see a film about uh, a Bulgarian tractor driver, you wouldn't come to the, the theater. But if I don't tell you, mm -hmm. and you do come, then you see the movie the way I saw it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or a Romanian abortionist, you know, uh, four months, three weeks, and two days, which was an unbelievable film. If you tell people what it's going to be about, then they don't get the effect of the film. They see the reviews. They hear their friends who said, "Oh, I read about that." Yeah, I don't they kind want of go into that. it with a little prejudice, right? And they, or they don't go. Mm -hmm. So the idea for Talk Cinema was to set up to bring that experience of discovery, you know, uh, uh, at at a couple of different levels. When you go see a good movie, it takes you to a place in the world where you discover something about that world, and then you discover something maybe about yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but also to get you to go to the, that, wor that experience, you need to be willing to discover um, a, a film without having been told that it's like a great meal um, that has been pre-reviewed and pre-digested for you. you know? mm -hmm. That's what talk cinema is. We show a film, mm -hmm. nobody knows what they're going to see till they enter the theater. Um, and then we have either somebody from the film come and talk about the, f the film afterwards or we have a, 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 another film critic um, and the film critic and I dialogue about the film afterwards and mm -hmm. then open it up for a discussion with the audience. And that's what I got out of working at the New York Film Festival. I thought that when in seeing people have the ability to talk to Mike Lee or to talk to um, uh, various you know, actors or, or directors that they would enjoy the, that uh, experience, um, but it didn't have to be at a film festival. It could be year-round, and it could be a surprise when they went to see the, uh, a movie in a theater, you know, as members of a film series. I find that the, I guess, the person that you're speaking to after, and you kind of dissect the whole film with the audience there, is, you know, must be a terrific experience. Because sometimes, you know, you just, as you see something, maybe just not catching it the first time around, you know, you'll be able to point something out to them that they may not have noticed about the film or get a little background on it. There is a, um, a, a lot of value to having a guided conversation exactly. um, about a film. I um, occasionally listen in on various you know, book groups and things. And one of the things that I see is missing in a book group is they don't often have a guide, somebody who's really conversant in the literature that I've hand. When you have a guided conversation about film, you get a lot more out of the film. Uh, uh, that dialogue, it is, you know, it, partly in America, everybody is a critic, you know. Uh, everybody looks at a movie and say, well, I'm, I'm smart, I know what a good movie is. But sometimes you, you need the help of somebody who has seen more movies than you um, to sort of set the table a little bit uh, wider. Mm -hmm. um, so that you can come to the film and find out things about it that you didn't know, maybe even why you resisted the movie, and it might prompt you to go see the uh, film for a second time, because oftentimes, and I say this a lot, it's the second time that you see a movie where you really see what the 
the heart of the movie is. Mm -hmm. And some movies get better and some movies fall apart mm -hmm. um, when you do that. And I, I, you know, I see differences in audiences. They respond differently to films. Mm -hmm. um, I'll show one, a film like Lunchbox, which we showed this year, to an audience in, in Philadelphia, and they respond to the psychology of the, the character. I show it in Washington, they respond to the underlying politics. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really amazing to see. So audiences are doing their own projecting when they look at a film. Mm -hmm. So now the series that you have coming up in Lincoln Center, um, the New York City sneak preview film series, so no one knows what that film is going to be. No, and in, in this area, I have one at the Performing Arts Center at SUNY Purchase as well, okay. mm -hmm. it's, and one at Lincoln Center. Nobody knows what the films are going to be. We start in September. They come um, uh, and are how, surprised. How often? I guess it's every month or about twice a month, I notice on the schedule. Yeah, it's 14 sessions, I think, at Lincoln Center, and it's... Uh, I think 10 at the Performing Arts Center in, in, in Purchase. Mm -hmm. um, it's a Tuesday night in Purchase. It's a Sunday morning mm -hmm. uh, at Lincoln Center. And, you know, you got to imagine that uh, the people who come are pretty fanatic because they get up on a Sunday morning, <laughs> you know, when they could be in bed and they come see a movie. Uh, well, that's from a perfect way to spend a Sunday, to go see a movie. To me. And then sit around talking about it. And, and then go out for a nice lunch. You know, they show up at, at the Performing Arts Center at Purchase on a Tuesday night. They've, you know, many of them have worked uh, all day. They come uh, to the movie. They, they have a, a unique experience, and then they go out to dinner afterwards, but w after we have our conversation about the film. So, you know, you also do something called a film uh, immersion, where you're actually going to, let's say, the Montreal Film Festival or one of the film festivals in uh, Europe, and... Explain to our audience a little bit about how that, um, it's like almost a guided tour of the city, but also you're doing, like a, 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 a covering a film festival. We, we thought that there were so many um, requests from people to say, you know, do you think you could take us to the Cannes Film Festival? And I'm available for that, by the way. <laughs> you, you would come to that one? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Let me know. The problem is that it, at Cannes and Sundance in Toronto, they're, they're professional festivals. Mm -hmm. They're for the business. It's like going to, saying you'd like to go to the Milan or Paris fashion shows. You know, mm -hmm. It's for Anna Wintour at the top of the food chain and the rest of the press corps and the buyers and all of this. Um, and they're, they're really not looking for, for people who are maybe... Uh, uh, fans or aficionados of film or fashion, they're, they're, it's a business convention and it's a misnomer to think of it as a festival. Right. Um, and <clears throat> so rather than do that, um, we began to start taking people to film festivals maybe 20 some years ago. We took people to the Vancouver Film Festival where they had you know, a wonderful time in a first class festival. And we developed a set of festivals that we now regularly go to. I'm about to go to the Montreal Film Festival that you mentioned mm -hmm. because that way people can have the film festival experience, you know, of going into a film, having a complete smorgasbord of films in four or five or six or eight, you know, theaters uh, within a few blocks uh, radius from their hotel. Mm -hmm. They can start it at 10 o'clock in the morning and go till, you know, midnight uh, and see movies, but they can take time out to do Montreal. We take people to Reykjavik in October. I'm taking a, another group to Havana, to the Havana Film Festival in mm -hmm. December, uh, Palm Springs in January. And we've taken people everywhere from Marrakesh to Jerusalem to the film festivals there. And you really see not only film, but you see the country that's watching the film with you. You see the locals and you go out and you go into their city and you experience the city. So it's a wonderful sort of thing. We have breakfast with film directors who come you know, to talk cinema and tell us about the making of their film and, and what it took to do it. So that was going to be actually my other question. So it's kind of set up like the film series that you do here in, in New York where you'll have someone involved with the film do a, a talk as well. Yeah. Um, but there it's very personal. Um, when you come to uh, uh, Lincoln Center to the Walter Reed Theater, we have a director come and, and they stand on stage and I ask them a few questions and then I facilitate the conversation between people and you know the audience and, and the director. But when you go to, 
to Reykjavik, um, you're in Iceland, you're in great nature, but the director of the film has breakfast with you and sits down at your table, and we all have a discussion about the film uh, with the director or the producer or the actors, etc. So that's the great value of going to film festivals in general because directors are open. If they see you on the street and you come up to them and say, I really liked your film, they'll talk. They'll go out and have uh, a bite uh, to eat with you. They won't at Cannes and, and Sundance and all of those places because it's become the celebrity meat fest and they're protected as though they were you know, major political figures. But at a festival like, like Reykjavik or Palm Springs, you mm -hmm. know, it's all very easy to be able to relate to people who've made films. Um, mm -hmm. And that's great. You can have casual conversations because, you know, they're not gods. They uh, put right. on their uh, skirts, two legs at a time. <laughs> and they're probably looking forward to maybe just discussing it with the average person without all of the paparazzi and various things that happen at some of the bigger festivals. And, the, and, and to step outside the publicity shield that mm -hmm. protects them from the real world. They're, you know, talent really on the one hand really likes the publicity shield but on the other hand they also it's like you know what clinton said about the white house being the crown jewel in the federal penitentiary system <laughs> you know being a, a, a famous uh... actor or actress can uh... is enormously flattering and comes with its perks but sometimes you just want to be able to sit down with a group of people and have a normal conversation especially if it's an intelligent one exactly so you know having been to the Cannes Film Festival this year. Um, what can you tell us about it? Um, I know that you mentioned a couple of things on your website, and that would be uh, TalkCinema.com, mm -hmm. some films that our audience should keep an eye out for. Well, you know, Jackie, this is my notebook. The Bible. This is the Bible. I buy this every year, and I fill it up with reviews and notes of films that I both am going to talk about on radio. I, I mentioned to you that I do WBGO radio down That's in Newark. Right. And I use this, you know, for programming. So here I go right to my can, you know, section, um, and I saw Foxcatcher, mm -hmm. um, which is going to come out in October and I think is being going to be aimed at awards uh, season. Uh, it's a great, you know, film with, that was done by uh, Bennett Miller, who is a Westchester native. I think he grew up in the lower part of the county. Mm -hmm. Um, and it has Steve Carell as playing John DuPont um, uh, on his Philadelphia estate, uh, supporting the American wrestling team in the 1990s until he killed one of them um, mm -hmm. for reasons that nobody quite understood because he's a little he was a little crazy. Okay, do we understand them now, or the film kind of leaves it open as to? Well, it it. It, it, it walks you up close to, you know, all the participants. And there's a lot of mystery surrounding that character. Um, and I think the lead in that is also, I want to say, Channing Tatum. Channing Tatum was, yes. uh, was mm -hmm. in it and Mark Ruffalo. They, they were brother. They played the two brothers, um, the Schultz brothers, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Dave and, and Mark. And um, uh, Channing Tatum plays uh, the, the sort of younger, shyer, you know, brother who is all about the wrestling, whereas Mark Ruffalo has a little bit more leadership capabilities and it has a, a bit more presence and charisma. And there's something about him that one day just uh, irks John DuPont and he kills him. Mm. Um, so, you know, there's that. There was The Homesman with Tommy Lee Jones, which was a terrific film. Um, there's all, there was Winter Sleep, which won the Palme d'Or. It's a Turkish, three-hour Turkish film. Now, if I told you you were going to sit through a three-hour <laughs> Turkish film, you'd say, Harlan, I'll see you afterwards for lunch. But if I show it, you'd love it. Because yeah. you get a chance to really go inside another country and another culture mm -hmm. in a way that's intimate um, and personal and in a way that you can understand. Mm -hmm. What um, is it about exactly? Um, it, it's a story about a, um, a man who is an intellectual um, who lives in the country um, side of Turkey and it's his relationships with all of the various people that um, depend on him. There are <clears throat> uh, people who are living on rent, in a rented uh, farmhouse on his land. There's his wife. Um, and it's, it really gets you into the heart of what are the forces that are driving modern-day Turkey crazy. Mm -hmm. you know? um, 
And it's an, that's what film does, is it, it allows you to take a camera and go right up inside somebody's living room and listen to them, you know, as they, they fight and as they love and as they, you know, have problems that are bigger than them. Live day to day, yeah, yeah. and deal with their economy and their, yeah. their lives. So you also mentioned there's another film, I guess, um, Grace of Monaco with Nicole Kidman. Well, that opened the film festival. Mm -hmm. and there was a lot of want to see of that in, uh, on that, in part because... <coughs> Excuse me, Monaco is just right next door, mm -hmm. and everybody knows Grace Kelly, and everybody knows Nicole Kidman, and <coughs> unfortunately, it wasn't. Uh, you didn't care for it. It was okay. Um, I, you know, what was it lacking exactly? It, the the well, the concept was that Grace of Monaco essentially saved Monaco from a French invasion by uh, uh, President de Gaulle. That's a pretty tall order to swallow. <laughs> um, <laughs> That is. You know, it, they turned it into Grace as sort of superwoman um, mm -hmm. in, in the mode of, you know, admiring strong women. Uh, it, it just didn't hang together all that well. But it wasn't historically accurate and it, wasn't, it didn't have many, too much meat to it. Um, those who know the politics of the situation well say that Grace actually probably wasn't responsible for as much as the film says it was. So, yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't tell you, you know, just exactly... Uh, what the historical accuracy is, but it, it struck me as slightly far-fetched. Gotcha. So, you know, as all interviews do, you know, we're winding down. We seem to be running out of time a little bit. So I'd like to just um, go over, you know, where our audience can catch you next. Um, you have the series over there, Purchase, and also down in the city. Um, how can they reach you to participate in the film series? Um, they can always reach me through Talk Cinema here in Peekskill. Uh, my phone number is in the book, uh, Talk Cinema, uh, or TalkCinema.com, our website. Um, my email is Harlan at Talk Cinema. Mm -hmm. um, if they want to go on any of our trips or they want to join any of our series, <clears throat> or if they have family in any of the Talk Cinema cities where we do series from Washington, Boston, uh, Chicago. Are they run independently or are you, you're flying over there too? Um, there, I have film critics in each of those cities who run the morning. I mm -hmm. pick the films and program the series, okay. and I, you know, I'm a little bit um, uh, in motion to all of those series. I like to go in and drop in. I feel like I'm not just Harlan Jacobson. I'm Harlan Sanders, the chicken man from Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> you know, I, I sort of drop in, see how they're frying the chicken, and, and, <laughs> and how their talks are going, and how their talks are going. And I, you know, I like to talk to the audiences um, and be the guest critic for a particular week because. I think it's important to maintain contact with the uh, audiences so because it's a very personal experience. You know, experience. Yeah, because yeah, it's, you know, your baby. So I want to thank you for coming on the show. Um, I'm going to try and make it down to one of the uh, film series that you have because I've been wanting to do it for a while. So I think I'll just uh, kind of motivate myself to do that. And I, and I strongly encourage all of our audience over there in uh, the living arts world. I hope you enjoyed this interview. Definitely um, look into Harlan Jacobson's um, Talk Cinema further via his website. You can go ahead and like us on Facebook, um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And as always, I want to thank you for tuning in. We'll talk again soon. Peace.